Welcome to note set number 18, and uh, looks like we've got a short one here, only 10 slides, but we'll see um, how long it takes us to get through this. Um, and so now we're going to focus on discrete time signals. We're totally switching. Uh, we now know about the sampling theorem uh, from the last uh, lecture, and uh, we now are going to see how we can analyze discrete time signals in the frequency domain just like we did for continuous time signals. So, um, you know, we had all these Fourier ideas for continuous time signals, and we, we've seen how useful and effective that is. Um, so, for discrete time, we want to define the same kind of idea. Um, we now are going to have to um, put a, 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 an adjective or a descriptor in front of our Fourier transform. So when we talk about Fourier transform of continuous time signals, we'll talk about the CTFT, or continuous time Fourier transform. Uh, and then we'll also have a, a DTFT, discrete time Fourier transform, for discrete time signals. And, and we'll see that, this, that they are very much uh, that they're very similar. There's a few differences, but um, for the most part, they're they're more similar than they are different. Now, the interesting thing is that the CTFT, as we've seen, is pretty much a tool that allows us to think about how our systems are going to operate. But we'll find out that the DTFT, even though it it, it itself can't be numerically implemented, uh, but we can implement something very similar to it that's called the DFT or the discrete Fourier transform. So I know it's an alphabet soup there but um, shouldn't be too hard for you to keep track of the CTFT, the DTFT, and the DFT. Oh and we'll throw in one other one. We'll talk about the FFT. Uh, so that's a lot of FTs but uh, I think you'll be able to keep track of them all if you think carefully about it. Um, so, uh, the most important thing that we'll see is how all of these Fourier transforms are related to each other, and only once you know that can you reliably use these tools, uh, especially this DFT, this computer processing version, um, to actually look at a signal in the frequency domain and be sure that you're seeing things correctly and, and properly. So. Um, yeah, so recall what we were talking about in our sampling analysis. Um, we showed that if we started with a spectrum that looked like this, um, halfway through the DAC we got something that looked like this with all these spectral replicas. And as long as we sampled fast enough, we could isolate the original signal there. Now, um, this is something that, that we were seeing theoretically inside the DAC. Um, and what we want to know is, um, since this signal here really only depends upon these values, right? These values get fed into this impulse generator um, to create this signal. So um, x tilde of t depends completely and only on these samples. So if we can see this kind of thing um, in theory here, couldn't we see it also in terms of these samples directly? And that's what we want to try to take a look at here. And that will lead us to this idea of the DTFT. So this picture is trying to say, instead of getting this Fourier transform from here, um, is it possible to get it from those samples? Um, so if we've done sampling perfectly, um, then we know that this thing would show us um, our original Fourier transform uh, perfectly. And so if we could somehow from this compute this, if we've sampled properly, that will show us the Fourier transform of that. Now that's a pretty remarkable thing and it would allow us to build a little system that would take in a continuous time signal, take samples of it, um, process those samples and show us a numerically generated approximation to the Fourier transform of our original continuous time signal. That would be pretty amazing. Um, now, this thing here is something that 
we've only been dealing with conceptually here. We want to know, can we do this in a more numerical kind of way? So um, since x tilde of t is completely determined by the samples, can we compute this thing or something related to it directly from the samples? That's the question we're trying to answer. So this is what we did in our sampling analysis. We said x tilde of t. We expressed it this way. We wrote it out this way. That was the um, uh, impulse sampling viewpoint. And then we said, well, let's replace this delta sub t by its Fourier series. And we got this result. And it was this modulation that led to the recognition that there, oh, yes, there are spectral replicas. So that was our theory, our analysis of the theory of this. Um, now what we're going to do is do a different path. So I've left the path we've already gone down um, here to show you and remind you what we did before. But here's the path that we're going to do now, a slightly different mathematical path. Um, we're going to take this back inside where we had it before. So that's where it was before. Um, and now we're going to take the Fourier transform of this thing. I mean, this is a continuous time signal, right? It's a function of t. We're summing over n, so this is not a function of n anymore. It's a function of t. It's an actual continuous time signal. So I can take its Fourier transform. So when I pass the Fourier transform inside the sum, as far as the Fourier transform goes, this is just a number in front of each one of these different impulses. And that's just a shifted version of the impulse. And so now I take the Fourier transform of an impulse that's been shifted. Fourier transform of an impulse not shifted is 1. Shifted with the shifting property is 1 times an e to the j term. And I get this. So right here, this is the Fourier transform of that shifted um, impulse. And so what this tells us is a new way to think about x tilde of t here. We interpret it to be the shifted spectral replicas plus our original spectrum. That tells us what it looks like. But this tells us how to compute it in terms of the samples. Very important result. Um, and it's this result that we end up referring to as the, um, after a little bit of manipulation, as the discrete time Fourier transform. So um, we just need to do a little bit of manipulation and redefinition. So here's the thing that we just found. Um, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to go in here and say, OK, here's an omega t t is my sampling interval. Omega is my continuous time uh, frequency variable. Let's just group those together to find a new variable, omega, capital omega. Uh, and now we get something that looks like this. We now have um, the omega showing up here, where we've replaced that. So we now have the thing on the right-hand side is a function of omega. So we now can say x of omega. Um, capital Omega. So we have to keep track between lowercase Omega and uppercase Omega. Now that Omega is called the discrete time frequency. We saw that an, a long time ago um, in one of the early lectures when we were talking about discrete time frequency of a discrete time sinusoid. And we saw that it had units of radians per sample. Well, let's see that this has the same units. Omega has units of radians per second. T has units of seconds per sample, because it's the spacing between samples and seconds. And so the seconds cancel, and we're left with radians per sample. So yeah, it's consistent with what we've seen before. So x tilde of omega and x of omega, despite their differing um, notational concepts, um, are really just the same thing, just plotted with respect to a different unit. So it's like plotting versus, you know, one thing versus meters and, and the same thing versus feet. Um, so we've got two different frequencies. And this really tells us the connection between continuous time 
frequency domain ideas and discrete time frequency ideas. So the DTFT looks like that thing with all the spectral replicas. Um, so when we convert that axis into omega, what we find out is that the point that was at fs becomes 2 pi. The point that was at fs over 2 becomes pi. Um, so we can plot this DTFT versus this omega axis, and we see all the spectral replicas. They are part of what's there. But what we realize is that if we define this DTFT this way, we realize that, gee, we only really need to look between minus pi and pi. Everywhere else is a replica of what happens there. So let's limit ourselves to just look between minus pi and pi. But never forget that there's th those replicas outside. Because if we do something like frequency shifting, which we will be doing, um, the replicas get shifted too. Um, so um, you can get caught with some weird things if you don't account for the effect of the replicas. But the point we're trying to make here is that if we've done everything correctly and we somehow manage to compute this DTFT directly from these samples and we look between minus pi and pi, we can see that the DTFT shows us this Oops. I went the wrong way there. The DTFT shows us this thing that we've been calling X tilde of F, which is a CTFT of the signal halfway through the DAC. But we've already know already know that if we do our sampling correctly, that that thing X tilde of F shows us the CTFT of X of F. So really this intermediate result is irrelevant to us now. The important thing is if we do our sampling right, quote unquote right, minimize the aliasing errors to the point where they're negligible, and we take our samples and we use that equation and we at least in principle compute this DTFT, and we look between minus pi and pi, what do we see? We should see something that looks just like the CTFT of this originally band-limited signal. Now, in the real world, we'll have effectively band-limited signals, anti-aliasing filters, and so forth. Um, but we can design all of those things so that they're kind of transparent and um, you know, not really making a, a significant impact or muddying the picture. And basically what this tells us is that we now have a way from the samples, properly taken samples, of seeing what the CTFT looks like. That is amazing. So just to show you some of the relationships here of the DTFT, um, so there's our uh, beloved triangular spectrum uh, showing up out in the continuous time world. Um, from these samples here we can get the DTFT and from this X tilde of T we can get this at least in theory the CTFT now this is one step closer to not just theory but real processing and that's the key to the power of this viewpoint now this will also well let me back up the things that we're talking about here is like a, a signal analysis kind of thing we're interested in analyzing the signal to see what it is made out of. Um, what kinds of frequencies does it have in it? Um, but w this DTFT will also allow us to do analysis of the system. Just like we use frequency response based upon Fourier transforms for continuous time systems, we'll be able to do the same kind of thing. So we'll be able to effectively say, look, I know continuous time signals are the things that exist in the world, but let's map those into a discrete time signal through a, an appropriate sampling process. Um, the original signal is going to have some sort of CTFT, but now those samples will have some appropriate DTFT, and if we've done things right, we'll see the effect or the, the, the um, characterization of the original continuous time signal in this spectrum but now here comes the kicker now I can define a system 
that will, through a frequency response, change the shape of this thing. It will also change the shape of the replicas. To make a new DTFT, we've attenuated some of the high frequency components here. And now we go back, so that's for this. Now we go back through a DAC and we get a Y of T back. And the CTFT of that signal is a modified version of this. So it almost looks like this whole thing is some equivalent continuous time system. But we're now free to implement the system not with resistors, inductors, and capacitors, but with computer processing, which can be cheaper smaller, lighter, lower power, but also much more flexible in what we are able to do with our processing. We're not limited by just capacitors that have a certain VI relationship and inductors that were a whole new world opens up and we're able to do some pretty amazing things. And that's what we'll be looking at over the next several lectures. So I'll see you next time. Thanks.